All right, so let's start by addressing the elephant in the room. This mess behind me. Slow and soggy commute home for drivers battling to exit the Westgate freeway. Some even forced to get out and walk. There are long delays for drivers across the city. Flash flooding hit much of Melbourne's west, from Brunswick to Laverton. And in case you haven't figured it out yet, my office happens to be in Laverton. So while all this mess was going on outside, here's what was happening inside. But don't worry, this is not the first uh, bump in the road of my uh, sports videography career, and um, I'm sure there'll be others, but I'm the sort of guy that likes to think that things happen for a reason and that somehow this will start a chain of events that will lead me to a better place than where I was before the storm. And actually it sort of makes sense to be talking about my new Sony FX3 camera in this context because it's sort of a series of bumps in the road that led me, a Canon user for the last, what, eight years, to buying a Sony camera and so far I'm Pretty happy with the results. My main issue with Canon is this thing right here, the RF mount. I've got nothing against the mount itself and I think RF lenses are great, very expensive, but great. Typically when buying gear, you tend to stay within your brand's ecosystem, in my case, Canon's, because once you bought your first camera, you then buy a bunch of lenses and eventually when you, buy, when you wanna buy a new camera, um, you tend to stay within that same brand because that way all your lenses will still work with your new body. Which is what I was planning to do, looking very seriously at the Canon C70 as my new weapon of choice which would have been a serious upgrade from my recently waterboarded Canon C100 Mark II. May they rest in peace. But because Canon introduced the RF mount on all their new cameras, or at least all the new cameras on the level that I was after, it basically meant that whether I stayed with Canon or moved on to Sony or any other brand for that matter, I would still have to buy new lenses anyway. And I know that I could use adapters like this one and just keep using my EF lenses with it. But at the end of the day, for me, this is just another thing that I have to carry around, another thing that could potentially break. And if I'm gonna spend that much money on a camera, I really wanna maximize its potential and not feel like my lenses are suddenly holding me back. So that's when moving to Sony became a real option for me. Um, I was actually gonna also re receive um, a C70 camera from Canon. They were gonna send me one specifically to do this video and I was gonna compare both the, the, the FX3 and the C70 and not tell you guys which one's mine and which one's the loner. And I was gonna compare both the C70 and the FX3 and say something like, by the end of this video, you'll know which one I bought and why. Um, but yeah, COVID, uh, for, uh, yeah, COVID fucked me over basically because, uh, we had, there was a big outbreak in Sydney where, where Canon Australia is. And then, uh, there was a big one in Melbourne as well, where I am. So everything shut down, big lockdowns, no going to the office, no sports. A lot of seasons got canceled and things like that. So Nothing was happening on that front for, for, for the video anyway. And, um, and yeah, when, when months later, when it was finally over, I reached out to Canon to uh, get this project going again. And they sort of politely let me know that they 
they had basically moved on from the idea of making this video with me. So what I want to do now is first of all explain why I find it so important to work with a cinema camera like the Canon C70 or the Sony FX3 when filming sports. Then I want to give you the pros and cons of each and finally tell you why I ultimately chose the Sony. So I almost exclusively film sports with cinema cameras for a few reasons. First of all, I love the cinematic look of DSLR and mirrorless cameras, which is why I stay away from camcorders. But at the same time, because I'm shooting unpredictable, fast-paced action in a very run-and-gun style, I really need the practicality features of a camcorder. And a cinema camera is basically the best of both worlds. I get to keep the look and feel of DSLR and mirrorless cameras, but I have access to much more professional tools when it comes to the body of my camera. For example, all the settings that I might want to change while I'm recording are easily accessible with buttons, wheels, and joysticks on the camera body. Which means that I don't have to stop recording to make an adjustment, I don't even have to go in the menu. Everything is there from white balance to exposure to audio levels. Basically anything that could suddenly need to change while you're filming. Another big plus with cinema cameras is that they have no recording time limits and they have fans and cooling systems that prevent them from overheating in any condition, in theory. With a cinema camera, you can also use shutter angles instead of shutter speeds so that basically you can change your frame rate and your camera will automatically adjust the shutter speed based on the shutter angle that you picked. So, for example, let's say that you like to um, use a shutter speed that's double your frame rate. All you need to do is set your shutter angle to 180 degrees and basically don't have to do anything else because every time you'll change your frame rate, your camera will automatically select a shutter speed that's double your frame rate based on a 180 degree formula. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip features like the ability to film raw or the whole bitrate conversation because I just think I'm gonna lose a lot of people with that topic and also we need to talk about external recorders and things like that. So instead, I'm just gonna skip all that and address the last thing that I find really necessary on a cinema camera. Well, actually there's two things, internal ND filters and XLR audio inputs. And that's where things get complicated because both the C70 and the FX3 are a bit of a letdown in these categories. My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined. But you see, both the C70 and the FX3, even though they are officially called cinema cameras by their own respective manufacturers, in my opinion, are much more so hybrids between a mirrorless camera and a cinema camera, which is totally fine because that's how you save on price. The Sony FX3, for example, is $2,000 cheaper than the FX6, the most comparable real cinema camera that Sony makes. And the Canon C70 is literally half the price of the C300 Mark III, which again is the most comparable camera in Canon's cinema camera line. So, of course, all those more expensive models co cost more money for, uh, you know, several reasons. And I'm okay with missing out on most of those reasons. But with the uh, Canon C70, for example, the XLR inputs are actually mini XLR ports, which basically means that you need an adapter to use XLR um, microphones with them. And you already know by now how I feel about adapters. And in this particular case, it also means that you've got this piece of metal basically that's gonna be dangling off your camera and potentially hitting it every time you move around. And you know, again, with the amount of money that you're dropping on the camera, I don't necessarily want to have these XLR connectors hitting it all the time. With the Sony FX3 on the other end, the XLR inputs are perfect. You can even remove them if you don't need them, which makes it an even smaller camera. But the problem with that one is that there are unfortunately no internal NDs. So why did I end up buying the Sony FX3? Well, for me, it wasn't as much about performance because at the end of the day, I think 
the Canon C70 does a few things better, and then the FX3 does a few other things better. So to me, it all came down to money. And I'm not just talking about the camera itself, which by the way, the Sony FX3 is $1,500 cheaper than the Canon C70, which, you know, is quite a gap. But it also comes down, like I said at the beginning, to the price tag attached to the RF mount. Because if I'm gonna buy two or three new lenses as well, it all adds up. For example, if we take, for sake of argument, a 24 to 70 mil f2.8 zoom lens, the Sony version of that lens costs $1,800, while the Canon RF version of it costs $600 more. Not only that, but with a Sony camera, I have the opportunity to save even more money by buying a Sigma or a Tamron equivalent, which is exactly what I did. This lens is much lighter than the Sony. It feels very plasticky to be honest, but the glass quality and the autofocus capabilities are almost just as good as the Sony model for literally half the price. Meanwhile, Canon is the only company in the world producing RF lenses. And as you can imagine, they have a pretty high price tag across the entire line of RF lenses, which again, are amazing lenses. But I just feel like for me, after two years of COVID and what the impact that it has, has had you know, on my career, um, putting myself in a position where buying a lens would be you know, that much more expensive, uh, would be a bit of a dumb thing to do. Fuck. Fuck, 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 fuck. Fuck. So I guess one of the lessons I've learned uh, over the past few weeks is that even when you make all the right financial decisions when buying equipment, your gear and your wallet are ultimately at the mercy of things as unpredictable as the weather or as easily avoidable as a faulty fucking tripod. So anyway, I've used my Sony FX3 a few times now and I'm quite happy with the results. Obviously, I'm very new to Sony and to S-Log3 and to this particular camera, so I'm very much so still figuring things out. For example, I recently filmed a basketball workout the other day and I was really struggling with my exposure and my colors, especially considering the mix of the neon light and the daylight coming through those huge windows. It was really hard, but I could still see a great potential. I got Hennessy and Hort Chata, baby girl wearing Nada, ass growing from a Sada, bad robe in his Prada, Fiji water by the cold glass, granddaddy by the zip lock, flex season, I'm road running, I'm staying on. All of my tip top, young man with an old mind, so I ain't worried about slight shit. I be up till sunrise, I'm staying out on my night shift. I got a bottle of bourbon, a bundle of honeys, I'm jiggy, I'm flexing the bitch. Figured I hit it and quit it, I'm busy, I ain't got the minutes for texting it, bitch. Came from the gutter with me and my brother, I'm moving my mother right out of the city. Bitch, I'm a star and they know I go hard, so I'm kissing them babies and signing them titties. Go blingin' like Chingo, rock star like Ringo. Checks coming in back to back, I'ma line them up like Bingo. Oh, I think that they like me They be all of my wood tip Not a stain on my white tee I'm popping all of this good shit Bottom line, this camera has all the features you need to produce great sports videos. It can record at 100 or 120 frames per second in 4K. It has great in-camera image stabilization. And for all the sports videographers out there complaining about the quality of their image when filming in poorly lit gyms, this is definitely the camera for you because it has dual native ISO. And a native ISO is basically the ISO value at which your camera will produce the cleanest image with the most dynamic range. So for the Sony FX3, 
the native ISO is at 640, and that's where there'll be basically no grain, no noise, nothing. It's the cleanest the image can be. And as I push the ISO up, I will gradually start introducing a bit more noise, a bit more grain in my image. But what a dual native ISO does is that it basically restarts that cycle all over again. So if I keep going up, you can see more and more grain, but then watch what happens when I hit 12,800, all of a sudden my image is clean again. See, if we go back to 10,000, you see a lot of grain. And then if I go back up, it all disappears. Big difference, isn't it? So yeah, this is definitely the camera for you if you're filming like high school basketball, for example. So anyway, if my crazy glue holds on, um, you should expect a lot more footage from this camera on this channel, as well as on my Instagram channel, by the way. So make sure you go follow me there as well if you don't already. And by the way, a lot of you have asked me about the new Sony ZV-E10, which is cheaper than the camera I currently recommend to sports videography beginners and also seems to potentially be better. So I do intend to put this camera to the test very soon so I can see if it can in fact dethrone the current sports videography budget camera champion, the Sony A6400. So make sure you subscribe if you don't want to miss that video. Otherwise, thank you all for watching. My name is E, and I hope I earned the privilege of your time.